Hi everyone, welcome to Story Club Live. I'm Faith Moore, and this is how to outline your novel. Um, I would love it if I see you guys all chatting already in the chat box, which is amazing. And that is where you will be able to keep chatting and also ask questions and interact with me throughout the course of the class. But right now, what I would love you to do is to have someone just type in there that you can see me and hear me because I would love it if I was not talking into a silent void because I see that there are some of you watching. So I just wanna make sure that you can see me and hear me but I'll just get started and make sure. Oh, it says we're live, which is awesome. That must mean you can see me and hear me. Um, so thank you so much for being here. This is amazing. I'm so glad that you could join me this evening. And we are going to talk all about outlines, which is one of my very favorite topics when it comes to novel writing. Before we do, just a few housekeeping things. As I say, I'm Faith Moore. Um, I am a writer and an editor and a stay-at-home mom, most importantly. Um, but for our purposes here, I am a writer and an editor. Um, in the description of this video, there are several helpful links. One is a link to just my website, which I can also put up on the screen right now, um, faithkmore.com. And that's where you can go to find my, uh, there's a link to my editing services page. So if you're looking for an editor and you might want to work with me. I would love to work with you. And it has some information there about um, all the different services that I provide and the and my rates and all kinds of things like that. And then there's a form there where you can contact me if you have questions or if you'd like to hire me. Um, I also have several other things on the site that you might like to explore. I have a, a blog that I haven't updated very recently, but there's a lot of articles on there that you can look through. Um, and just some other stuff about, about me is on there. There's some um, stuff for parents as well. And then that's also where you can find um, more classes. So I, I, that's where I post information about classes and other events. So you can check that out at my website as well. Um, I'll take that away now. Okay. Oops. Thank. There we go. Okay. I meant to take it away. There. Okay. Um, also, if you happen to be watching the interview on the Andrew Clavin show with me and my dad, Andrew Clavin, um, you might have heard that I also, in addition to being an, an editor, have a novel coming out later this year with Daily Wire Books. And I'm really excited about that. And I will, more will be revealed about that. But I, um, I actually do know what I'm talking about because I spend a lot of time in my day editing people's writing. And I also have done this myself. I have written actually many novels and one of them is coming out into the world for real. So I do have some some crud here. Um, I the other the other link that you will find in the description is a tip jar. This is a free class. I'm not going to mention this again, but I do gratefully accept tips for the work that I do. And so you can find a link there to my Venmo if you're interested in giving a little tip at the end of this. I feel icky even saying that, so we're gonna move on. Um, and one last housekeeping thing, the chat box, as I said at the beginning, is how you can interact with me. I will pause every so often to check. So if something I'm saying brings up a question for you, type it in there and I will get to it. Um, you can also interact with each other and I'll just kind of scroll through from time to time and I'll skip the comments that obviously aren't for me. But um, if you have a question, that's where you should put it and I will check. There's a little bit of a delay for me um, to see your comments. So, you know, if I haven't gotten to it yet on the next pause around, I'll probably get to it. Um, and... Is there anything else about the chat box? Oh, also, if you submitted questions beforehand in the Google form, I got those too, and I will go through and be addressing those as I go along. But if you feel like I somehow haven't hit it and I've already talked about something adjacent to what you were asking about, feel free to put it in the chat as well. Okay, so I already see some comments, but I don't think that any of them are questions for me yet. Um, people are saying they saw me on my dad's show, which is awesome. I'm so glad um, that you can see me. Fantastic. And I can't wait for my book. Thank you. I can't wait for my book either. 
I'm so excited. Okay, so we're here to talk about how to outline your novel. So the first thing I want to talk about is why you need an outline. Because there's this the big debate about this out there in the world of writing. And I would like to address this because I am a really big proponent of outlining. So of course, you've probably heard you've got the, the pantsers and the planners. The pantsers are flying by the seat of their pants, hence the name. And so they don't have an outline. They just kind of have a general idea maybe in their head or maybe even just a scene or a couple characters and they start writing and they just kind of see where it takes them. And then the planners are the writers who do create an outline. Some planners create extensive outlines and character lists and character sketches and, you know, maps of the different worlds that their stories take place in. So, you know, those are kind of the two extremes. My feeling is that you can generally tell when someone is, when the book you're reading is written by a pantser. You know, in the worst possible sense. There are kind of plot holes, the characters are inconsistent, um, you know, things don't make sense or the plot doesn't really move along. But even if they've done a pretty good job, you know, even if the plot kind of holds together and the characters make sense, you're usually looking at a plot that's not as tight as it could be, characters that maybe don't develop as well as they should. You can, And it's kind of more of like an aimless kind of story. And Maybe you like that kind of thing, but I tend to feel that it's good to have some planning under your belt before you get started, because I really do think that if you know what you're looking for, you can tell. And especially if you're just starting out, it's a really, really good tool to have. The other reason that you might want an outline is because you, you're you not sure yet if the idea that you have is a story worth telling right? You might have an idea for a story. And then as you start to plan it out, you might realize, wait, actually, this doesn't really make any sense. I can't, I can't bring this all the way to fruition. I can't turn it into a whole novel. Or I thought this was cool, but I'm actually not really interested in this as I come to look at all the different things that would need to happen in order to make this story make sense. And then you might want to put that in a drawer and move on. And it's good to know that before you've committed a whole bunch of words and uh, to paper and a whole bunch of time to writing something that you're going to end up throwing away. So a, an outline helps you to know whether the idea that you have is something worth pursuing. It's really great for first-time novelists. I really highly recommend an outline for everyone, but really for first-time novelists in particular, because again, it makes sure that you have something worth writing and it helps you to know what you're doing when you sit down to write and it, it kind of um, it guards against that kind of blank screen blinking cursor angst of I don't know what I'm doing I don't know what to write oh I'll just turn it off and try again tomorrow if you have an outline then you are pretty sure that you at least know what you're supposed to be doing when you sit down so you know and it and again it helps you to understand whether the idea that you have is just like an idea or if you can actually craft a story out of it and we'll talk more about that in a minute um outlines also help you flesh out other things about your story like your characters the setting the world that everybody's living in their motivations figuring out the plot helps you develop all of those different other pieces and so that you so you don't have to do it along the way or go back and change it later on um and i'm just checking my notes um okay and and it helps you to know it helps you to use your writing time as efficiently as possible so I am a stay-at-home mom and I write during my younger son's nap time, which is usually about an hour, maybe an hour and a half if I'm lucky. So I really need to know what I'm doing when I sit down. I don't really have the luxury of kind of like staring into space for a while or looking at the blank screen. So having an outline helps me get right to work. And that's an important and helpful thing too, because we're all busy and most of us probably aren't doing this full time. This is probably a side gig for most of us. So it's good to have that guide there for you. Um, I had a question before this about what to do if you're just stumped even at this stage. You, you know, you've got the idea, but you don't you don't know how to do this. 
So I'm going to address this more as I go along, but I did want to draw your attention, this might be useful for everyone, to another Story Club Live class that I taught a while ago called How to Actually Sit Down and Write, where I talked about this, this thing where you just, you know you want to write, maybe you have some ideas, but you're not sure how to get started. If you go to my website, faithkmore.com, and click on Writing Courses and Story Club Live, you'll see a form to fill out where you can purchase those were paid classes and but it's only it's ten dollars for the recording so you can reach out to me via that page and I can send you that but I'm also going to go through some other things that will help you okay so um actually I have I have a PowerPoint here that I'm going to share with you let's see how to outline your novel there's my website and okay so we're going to talk about what an outline is not because people tend to shy away from outlines because they think that they're kind of boring and unwieldy and unhelpful you know you write the whole thing and then you put it away and you never look at it again because it's actually not something that is helpful so let's talk about what it isn't so that we're clear okay so an outline is not a list of every single thing that happens in your story um right so it's not something it's not every single it's not every single thing that people say everything that people do every single moment in the story if it was that i could understand you feeling sort of fenced in and claustrophobic like once it's there it's somehow set in stone and you can't go back and um you know why do i want this because i want to feel freer so it's not that okay it's also not the entire book told in boring paragraphs right? Like it's not, it's not the whole story mapped out, written down in full sentences, in paragraphs for pages and pages and pages and pages, because if it was that, then, you know, that's just a sort of like boring uh, version of your novel. So it's certainly not that. And it's also not just one paragraph that summarizes the whole book. Um, that is something that you will need eventually when you submit your your novel to agents or publishers you will need it's called a synopsis usually um although that tends to be a little bit longer but usually you'll have some, like a a paragraph in your query letter for example you'll have a paragraph where you just kind of sum up this is what the book is about in kind of very direct language an outline is not that either because while the the whole book in boring paragraphs would be too much and too constraining. One paragraph that kind of like, that's almost like the back of the book, like the description on the back of the book, isn't going to actually help you. Um, you probably had all that in your head to begin with. So why write it down? So an outline is none of those things. So let's just clear that away. And then we can talk about what it actually is. I'm going to just check the chat because I see there's a couple of things. Um, so something about Little Mermaid. Uh, I've bulked at synopses. I've nearly always done character sketches and I always know I need to know where the story ends. Yeah, well, that's important. You definitely should know those things and character sketches are really helpful. Um, though I don't I don't necessarily think you need to physically write, you know, like a just a character sketch, like a description of each character beforehand, though it might be helpful for you if that's something that you do. Okay. So Thank you for those questions. I'll come back to the chat. So keep keep putting your questions in the chat. Okay, so that's what an outline is not. So what is an outline? An outline is a map, basically. It is, you, it's, it's a map. You literally follow it and it takes you where you need to go. Okay, so it's, it's actually a tool. If you're not using it, there's no point in writing it. So you want to write something that is going to be useful to you. And this is how I see it. I see it like a map. I know we all have Google Maps now, but like an actual physical map where, you know, you can plan out your route from point A to point B and see all the different stops that you might take along the way. So that is a useful tool, right? It is a tool for fleshing out your story and your characters and your world, etc. So you're going to use it, not just to kind of, not just as like a random exercise, but you're going to use it to create 
the element, the basic elements of your story that need to be there in your mind before you can actually tell the story. So it's a map, it's a tool for getting those basic elements ready to go. It's a way, and this is really important, it's a way to make sure you don't write yourself into a corner. See, when you just start writing, even if you think you know what's going to happen in the story, it's very likely if you don't have an outline that you're going to get to a point where you're like, oh, wait, he can't do the next thing that I want him to do because, you know, 50 pages before he did something that negates that. And then you're stuck either having to go back and rewrite what you already wrote or like figure something else out because you've basically you've written yourself into a corner. You, you have stuff already and you probably love it. You've probably fallen in love with it and you want to keep it. But now the plot isn't making any sense or you think it makes sense. I've done this. <laughs> I've done this. You think it makes sense and you write the whole thing and then you go back and you're like, oh, wait, none of these plot points can happen because back here, this character did this thing that makes it so that none of that can happen. Or like this character is actually in a different location than I need him to be now. And so I have to go back and figure out how to bring him over here. So having the outline beforehand saves you a whole bunch of time and a whole bunch of, of writing. You know, it, it saves you from having to cut a whole bunch of stuff that maybe you like, you know, maybe you've fallen in love with all this stuff and, you know, it saves you from, from doing that. And the last thing it is, it's a springboard for the writing process. Meaning when you, when you sit down to write, you're not thinking like, okay, so what's going to happen next? You know, what, what do I, what do I need now? You are looking at this document and saying, oh, right. Okay. This is the next thing I'm doing. And then you're turning to your actual word document or whatever you're using. And you're writing. So instead of spending a whole bunch of your precious, in my case, hour, thinking like, oh, okay, maybe we could have her go, you know, go here, or maybe they could meet, you know, at the park, and then realizing after a while that, mm, no, I don't like that, and deleting everything. You've already done that work in a much quicker and less kind of time consuming and emotionally intensive way. So you actually already know what you're going to write. And it still might feel like, oh, that wasn't how I wanted to say it, or that's not exactly what I wanted. And that's okay. You know, I'm not saying it's going to make it so that you just write, you know, the word one to word, whatever, with no breaks or corrections. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that it's going to help you to feel like you know what you're doing. You know where you're going because you have this map. Right. So that's what it is. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do a whole example for you and I'm going to show you what it should look like and how to do it. But I do see some questions. How detailed do you feel an outline should be? Should you be outlining beats on the micro level? I found myself just becoming an outliner and having trouble getting to the writing itself. Ah, okay. Good question. So I am actually going to answer this and I'm going to show you step by step an example for how, how to do this. So I will answer that question in detail. And yeah, you don't want to get so bogged down or so wrapped up in your outline that you just keep adding to it and keep kind of tinkering and moving things around and you don't actually get to the writing process. So yeah, you definitely could go too far and you definitely can't, there's a way to not do enough. So you need to find that sweet spot and hopefully I will show you how to do that. Um, Two of the best writing guidebooks I've read noted that the number one reason for writer's block is that you've written yourself into a corner without knowing it. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I think it it's a it can feel it can feel very kind of def, you know you can feel sort of defeated you know especially if you're trying this out for the first time and you're not sure if you're any good and you're not sure if you should do this and you've kind of devoted your time and then you suddenly realize like wait nothing that I wrote makes any sense delete everything never mind. Forget it. I'm just going to go back to my day job, right? Like you can really find yourself feeling depressed because of the fact that you haven't planned this out to begin with. So you definitely want an outline in that way. So moving on. Okay. One issue that you might feel like you have is you don't know how to structure your outline. You, you know, you've heard there's all these different kinds of like 
story structures and you know that you're supposed to kind of hit certain beats and there's maybe there's three acts and you're not really sure what that means. And so how do you organize your outline in a way that is helpful or is there a right way to organize your outline? You know, and that might sort of make you think, okay, I don't, I'm not going to do that one. I'm just going to write and hopefully it'll, it'll go okay, hopefully. And let's see, let's see what happens. But um, I really, I really, my advice is don't worry. Don't worry about story structure. Yes, there are lots of different ways to structure a, stor a story. There are lots of different names for the different story structures that exist. You can Google them and it might be interesting to look through them, but you absolutely do not need to be a master of all the different ways to structure a story in order to structure your own story. So don't be freaked out, right? Feeling freaked out about, no, don't be freaked out, okay? Instead, you just want to think about it this way, okay? Your story needs to introduce your characters and their world to the reader, you need to add some kind of conflict or problem, and you need to resolve the problem in some way by the end of the story. It doesn't have to be a good solution, everyone can die, but that is a resolution, right? Like there's some kind of problem, some kind of conflict, and the story needs to take us to a resolution of that conflict and problem. Either it's, it's good, the lovers reunite and everybody's happy, it could be terrible, everybody dies, it could be, you know, a mixture, the lovers meet and then die, whatever, but that's, that's what you need. And then, you know, there, you can, then you can organize it in lots of different ways. So maybe you start with the resolution and then take us back through and introduce the problem and, and introduce the characters and things along the way. Maybe the conflict starts right away and we, um, you know, maybe the conflict is really far in the past. It's happened, but now we're in the present and we have to unravel what went on in the past. Okay. Um, maybe you drop us right into the problem and introduce everything as you go, right? I'm not saying that you have to do anything. I'm not saying you have to have any particular structure. I'm just saying that these are the three basic elements and you can decide what order they go in and you can still write an outline as I will show you. Okay, so don't panic about how, you know, what's the right structure? How do I do this? Just know that these are the, the basically, the, the, these are the three basic elements that you need. And you can decide how you want that to happen. Okay, so we're going to do an example together. And because I just have been thinking and existing in the world of The Little Mermaid, because if those of you who don't know, I, I wrote a review for The American Spectator about the new Little Mermaid, and then I went on my dad's show and talked about it. So The Little Mermaid is very fresh in my mind. I know it's a movie. It doesn't matter. A novel. And novels and movies are, are in fact different, but they're more mostly different in the telling than in terms of like what it means to outline them. So I had a question about movie outlines versus novel outlines. And, you know, in terms of like the bare bones of the story and, and how you're going to do your outline, where I sit, there's not a huge difference. Of course, there's a huge difference for how to, how to tell the story and maybe what you're putting in your outline. But this structure that I'm going to teach you right now, you can use it for any kind of storytelling at all. Okay, so let's do an example. And I'm gonna use The Little Mermaid as an example. I'm gonna pretend that we're making up the story of Disney's The Little Mermaid, which obviously we are not. Please don't send me some sort of copyright violation. Okay, so the first thing that you need is a what if question. This is basically your idea. It's probably the original idea that you came up with when you decided that you were going to write a novel about whatever topic you've decided you want to write a novel about. So, you know, what if aliens land on another planet, you know, land on our planet? What if, um, you know, two lovers are, you know, separated because their families hate each other? Um, you know, it's, it's a what if. Maybe it didn't come into your mind as what if this. Maybe it came into your mind as an image or as a scene, but 
you can usually boil down or you should be able to boil down your basic idea into a what if question. And of course, for the Little Mermaid, the question would be, what if a mermaid wishes she could be human? And, you know, again, it is as simple as that. I mean, obviously in Disney's The Little Mermaid, there are all kinds of other things and there's all kinds of stuff you could add to this what if, right? Like what if a mermaid wishes she could be human, but then her dad says no, and then she meets a man and then, so she makes a no. All of that stuff comes later. The what if is the umbrella, the, the most basic version of this so that then you can kind of build the story from there. So you wanna begin with that, your idea, your what if. Okay, then you wanna determine the conflict. So, because, so this idea, it necessitates a conflict, right? So it, it comes hand in hand with the what if, because if the mermaid could just be human, like if, if there's no problem and there's magic in this world and everybody's fine with it and you know she just, okay, great, I checked that box, I'm a human now, there's no story, okay? Also, if it's completely impossible for, he, for her to be a human, then, you know, you, you might have a story like, you know, she wants to be and then, you know, it turns out that she can't. But you, but you probably, there has to be some question of whether it could happen or not, because otherwise, what is she doing, right? Like, okay, so she wants to be human, but it's impossible. So who cares? So there has to be some kind of, of conflict, some tension to make your story make sense. And it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't have to be like the be all and end all of life. Like some stories are more character driven and, you know, the conflict is just kind of like, you know, will these people stay friends <laughs> or, you know, will this, you know, lady decide to have a baby <laughs> or, or whatever, but there needs to be something that we're kind of rooting for our characters about or hoping that it doesn't happen or, or worried about. Okay. So in this case, the conflict is that her father hates the human world, but now she's fallen in love with a human man. Okay, so in this sense, um, we we need we need some reason why she can't just become human. Okay, so in you know they've decided that okay, so her father she's a, a teenager and her father says no and you know hates the human world, so she you know she's definitely at a disadvantage there. And then we need a catalyst, right? We need something. So she has this problem and she's been going on like this for a while. Something needs to kind of spark her desire to go forward with something new. And so in this case, you know, she had a kind of general sense of the human world. I want to be a part of it. I love their stuff. I want to know more. But now she's fallen in love with a guy and that guy is really there and she really wants to be with him. So that has sparked her to take this to the next level. So that is the conflict. Okay. So now we have our, our idea, our basic what if, and we have the conflict that the story is going to take us through to some kind of resolution. Okay. So in this example, we're going to use a sort of traditional three act structure. And as I said before, you don't have to do it this way. And I will talk a little bit later about what to do if you don't want to, you know, if you don't want to use this this general structure. But if you are doing this for the first time, I do suggest something along the lines of this. So act 1 is your introduction or your setup, okay? You um introduce your characters, your situation, and you kind of lead us to what is causing the conflict. Act two is where the conflict plays out. It's where we, you know, everything that, that has been introduced kind of comes to a head and something happens and our characters are propelled into this issue, whatever it is. And act three is the resolution. Again, it doesn't have to be a good resolution for everyone involved, but it's the resolution to the conflict that we've sort of had playing out for us in the center of, of the story. So um, again, you don't have to do this this way, but these elements 
are all probably going to be in your story, even if you mix them up, even if you, you know, start with act three and begin, you know, even if your act one is really the resolution and, you know, act two is the conflict or, or whatever, however you want to do it. But these basic, these three basic ideas should be in your story, unless you're doing something really avant-garde and you and in order to do that, you have to really, really know what you're doing. And you have to have written a whole bunch of things that are more like this basic structure before you break the rules. You have to know what the rules are in order to break them successfully in writing. Okay, so now let's talk about your actual outline, what your, um, what what's gonna be on your document, right? That you are typing to create this outline, okay? so. The first thing that you're going to do is you're going to summarize each act in one sentence, not a super long run on sentence that includes every single thing that happens. One sentence again, like so we had the what if was kind of the umbrella of the whole story. Now we're going to write little little umbrellas for the three different acts. OK, so here is an example. OK, so act one. We're introduced to the mermaid, the reason she wants to be human, and the things standing in her way. Okay? Act two. She makes a deal with a sea witch for legs, but has to complete a task in order to keep them. And here I'll just note, right, the, the making the deal with the sea witch might come at the very end of act one. And, you know, I would kind of say in the movie that's that's pretty much true. That's the end of act one. And then act two kind of takes place on land, right? And then act three takes place on land and in the sea. But again, I, I phrase it this way because the, you know, the deal kind of propels her into act two. So that's kind of act two. You can, you could have written it a different way. That's fine. Act three, the sea witch is defeated and her father relents, her being, her father being Ariel's father, not the sea witch's father, um, giving her legs. Okay, so those are your mini umbrellas and you have written them, you know, in bold or something at the top. I usually write act one and then the sentence, act two, the sentence, act three, the sentence. And I, you know, I know some people write their ideas and stuff in like with an actual pen and a notebook. And I do that when I'm still just kind of like thinking of different ideas. Um, but this you want to do in some kind of word processing program because then you're going to go back and write things under each one of these. So just a little tip for those of you who happen to use notebooks. Um, so uh, that's that's your first thing, okay? Your, your acts are the introduction is act one, act two is the conflict, act three is the resolution, and you're going to summarize each of those things for your particular story. Remember your what if and your conflict summarize them in one very simple sentence that doesn't include every single thing that happens. That's just the summary. And it's it's a good exercise to do this because it's hard. It's really hard to summarize the things that you've got going on in your head because you've got all the details in your head. So this is important, okay? Because this tells you, okay, this is what I need to have in there by the time I'm ready to move on to the next chunk of my story, okay? So that's the first part. You're going to say act one, sentence, act two, sentence, act three, sentence. Okay. Um, great. I'm just checking the chat and I'm drinking this water. Everybody seems fine so far. Remember, you can, if I'm saying something that doesn't make sense or you have more questions, put them in the chat because I am checking and I will, I will get to them. Okay. So you've done that. Now, under each act, you're going to list the beats, okay? Now, what is a beat, okay? Uh, the, the beats are, are the events that propel the story and the characters from one plot point to the next. So they are the plot points, but they're not every little thing that happens. So they are not, um, you know, he uh, he meets her in a restaurant and she is wearing a red dress, which he thinks is attractive. And he sits down and orders um, a beer and, you know, but it comes and he spills it on her. Right. Like that's too much detail. 
that's stuff that never actually even needs to be in your outline. That's stuff that will come because the plot necessitates it. The, the plot that you are creating with your outline necessitates certain things. And that will come out just as you write. Because if you put all that stuff in there, again, yeah, it constrains you. It becomes something that you have to do. Like, oh, did I do every single thing? Oh, wait, I don't like that anymore. I don't know. And then you throw your outline away and you're sad. So don't do that. Okay. So you just, these are not like chapters or scenes exactly, although they might turn out to be chapters and scenes, but they are, they're the little, little sort of propulsions, like the little things that, okay, you know, this one happens and that prompts something else to happen. And then that happens and that prompts something else to happen because this happened, something else has to happen. Those are your beats. Okay. And you might end up kind of playing around with these, um, you know, something that you put in uh, doesn't pan out in, you know, something you put in act one, you get to act two and you're like, oh, wait, that, that one beat there, that doesn't work. I have to rework that. But that's why you do it now, right? You want to do that now before you've actually written whole scenes that you love and then have to cut or have to make something up so that they make sense when they don't really make sense, okay? So you're just, you're trying to propel your characters from one act to the next using these little kind of blips, these beats, okay? So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through act one of The Little Mermaid in its entirety to show you what it would look like. And then and then I'll stop. I'm not going to go through the entire thing. You have other things to do with your life, presumably, but it should give you a sense of what your outline should look like and the kinds of things you want in there and the kinds of things that you don't. So we're going to do act one together and then I'll kind of riff a little on what would be an act two and act three so you get the sense of that um and then you know as we go put your questions and then um we'll talk and then i have you know some other kind of points that i want to to let you know about um but this is this is really the meat of the whole thing so this would be act one um which again we're introduced to the mermaid the reason she wants to be human and the things standing in her way right so that's what it says at the top and then um here are the beats OK, so um, we have to start with the mermaid doing something human related um, when she's supposed to be with her dad, because that's that's what we're trying to introduce here. We're trying to introduce the conflict between the mermaid and her desire to be human and the father and her and his issue with her being human. So we have to start with something that conveys that. So. The mermaid is collecting human artifacts when she's supposed to be at a function hosted by her dad. Okay, so it's just, it's a sentence. It's not what are, it's not what the artifacts are. It's not where she's doing that. It's not um, what the function is. You know, all of that will come out as you're writing and all of that is, is fine. And you don't, but you don't need it in there. You just need, okay, here's the introductory scene. This is what's happening. Okay, then um, we, need to learn more about this human obsession because that is the the actual issue here right so she's doing this thing and then frustrated the mermaid complains to her friend right so she's um she misses the function and you know the father you, you could even add in here you know her father yells at her for being into the human stuff when she's supposed to be at the function Okay, but so now we've given her a friend to complain to. And so she is, you know, we, we're learning the extent of her human obsession by giving her this friend to confide in. Okay, so now something has to lure the mermaid to the surface in spite of her father's warning, right? So, you know, she she's now been told in no uncertain terms that she can't um, that this is not allowed, she can't go to the surface. But now we're again, we're trying to to propel her from just her life that she's been living for however long to the next act, which is that she's gonna make a deal with a sea witch to get legs, right? Well, we have to get her from like just sort of normal teenage angst to this drastic de decision, right? So the next thing that we want to say is she sees fireworks and goes to the surface. So something new happens for her, and we and so, 
she does something different. She goes to the surface, even though she's not supposed to, because something really different is going on up on the surface. Okay, so now she's on the surface. Now we need to add an emotional detail to kind of seal the deal for her to, again, to propel her to the, the conflict. Okay, so she sees a man on board the boat and falls in love with him. Okay, you can have whatever feelings that you need to have about whether or not someone would fall in love in the space of time that it takes Ariel to fall in love. However, this is what happens in the movie. You could have it be different, but this is the kind of sentence that this, this is the beat that you're going to do here. Something has changed for her. She's moving from her regular complacent life to something that's going to cause her to make this drastic choice that you have outlined as the thing that happens in act two. Okay. So, um, you know, and this is, this, this is why something different is happening. This is something that's never happened to her before. And then you want to up the emotional stakes even further, um, by, and so there's a shipwreck and she saves the man. Okay, so she, something, something different happens. She goes to the surface. She sees something she's never seen before. And she, and then there's you know, a, a sort of emotional crisis, which solidifies this new urgency that you want her to feel. Okay. Um, and then now, you know, she's all the, all the things are in place and let's just, and then we just hit it home, right? We hit it home. Her father finds out about this and makes it clear he'll never relent, right? But now she is clear that she must do this. And that pushes her one step further so that the mermaid seeks out the sea witch and makes a deal for legs. Okay, so you you just put in each each moment that moves her one more step in her journey from wherever she started to wherever you want her to be in act two. Okay, so I see a question. Okay, I see some questions. Good, I want there to be questions. Do you have a feeling about how many beats, action reactions, should be in a given scene? Obviously this isn't a closed answer, but how do you know when you have too many or too few? Okay, so some, like if you Google like how to outline a novel and there are some sites that will tell you like a certain actual certain number, like like the one in particular that I'm thinking of, like there's a Save the Cat, right? Which is like a very specific uh, structure for novels and movies. And it, it gives you, uh, it gives you literally like there should be 15 beats here and you know the conflict should happen on this one beat i don't think that's true i think that stories are more nuanced i think that they you know that they're they're more there can be more fluid than that what i will say is you know you don't you don't want to spend so long in you know one act or the other that you've kind of forgotten where you're going i would say if you are paying attention to making sure that each beat moves you one step further to from point A to point from act one to act two or point A to point B, then I don't think you're going to have a problem. I think it's when you get wrapped up in all the little tiny details or you just kind of everybody's kind of static, but you liked the idea of this happening that's when you're going to get bogged down. So I, I'm sort of, I don't want to say a number because I think that that again is constraining. So I'm sorry, that's not really an answer, but I hope that's helpful. Okay. Um, how are you deciding what the need of a particular beat is? I'm not sure I totally understand that question, but I will try to answer it by saying, um, again, it's sort of each, each moment is building on the next moment to get you to the next act. So for example, if you started with, okay, you know, there she is collecting human artifacts and then she's like making a deal with the sea witch. You're like, that would be like, whoa, whoa. Okay, that was pretty drastic. I don't understand this character at all. What is going on, right? So the character motivation would be sort of opaque at that point, um, you know, but if, 
so but again if instead it's sort of like well you know the father says no and then she you know does it does something anyway and then he says no again and it's kind of the same thing over and over again then i would say cut that out it, the beat a beat is a point of motion it's a point of motion that takes you from one kind of em emotional character driven moment to the next um how detailed should it be be one sentence as well yes again right? There's the big umbrella, there's three little umbrellas, and there's little littler umbrellas underneath. One sentence, okay? One simple sentence. Um, okay. So, for example, you said, now we need an emotional whatever. Oh, so uh, that, I did say that, and I didn't mean that, like, at this exact moment, you always need an emotional whatever. <laughs> what I meant was, in order to get in this particular story, in order to get this person, this mermaid from just swimming around in the ocean to making like a super drastic decision that is kind of a bad idea, it, the the emotional beats need to build on each other. Like, like I just said, she can't just like suddenly do it. it. It has to be one kind of issue for her after another that culminates in, you know, doing this because everything has has built up on itself, right? She had this desire to begin with. Now her dad's really doubling down. Now she sees a man, then she saves him. She gets really close to him and now she really wants to be with him. So it's kind of like that emotional build. So it's not a, like a specific, oh, now you need this, now you need that. It's more the way that the story is building. Okay, do you ever try different story beats for the same scene? Like try different emotional story beats? Yes, and that's why you have an outline because you can, you could, you could write you know, three different versions of this and then pick one. Wouldn't it be better to have written it out in this very sort of bullet point succinct way than have written one novel and then another novel and then another novel or half a novel and then throw that in the garbage because it didn't work and the next one and the next one, right? So yeah, you, you know, I did this like, this happens and this happens and this happens because we all know the story of The Little Mermaid. You are going to have to be figuring this out and you're going to, you're probably going to start like, okay, here's the first beat. Here's the second beat. Here's the third beat. Wait, that doesn't make sense. Go back, figure it all out. And again, I can't tell you how to, do, no one can tell you how to do that. If someone's telling you how to do that, don't listen to them. You, you are the master of your story and you have to figure out how the different beats work. Um, you know, people can help you, but you know, no one, this story's don't write themselves you have you have to write them and this is the way that you're going to do it so yeah write this then rewrite it then rewrite it again make sure it makes sense so that you're not stuck when you start writing okay so again you would do this you do the same thing for act two right you would be thinking okay like what is this deal why is it the deal that way what is why does the sea witch want to make a deal um does the mermaid succeed to, you know, in getting the legs and keeping them, why are we not? I mean, who who does she meet along the way? And, you know, how do they all feature in the plot? What builds the relationship between the mermaid and the man? Do they get together? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Then you're moving on to act three. How is the sea witch defeated? What makes it seem like she might win before she fails? How does the man distinguish himself? Um, why does the father relent, et cetera, et cetera, right? I know I'm just saying a whole bunch of random things because like, you're not writing The Little Mermaid, okay? I wanna show you this structure. I don't wanna teach you how to write The Little Mermaid, okay? So, but it would look like that. Act one, a sentence. These, you know, a series of beats. Act two, a sentence, a series of beats. Act three, a sentence, a series of beats. The end, okay? That is what your structure look like. looks like. Okay, I'm gonna take the PowerPoint away so you can just see my face, hi. A couple of final thoughts actually quite a few final thoughts, and then I'll take final questions. Okay, the outline, your outline creates characters and it creates settings, and that's a good thing, right? So in this case, we had the mermaid, we had the father, we had the friend, the man, the sea witch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, um, and, it, and the plot that you create necessitates character traits for those characters. For example, the mermaid has to be independent, headstrong, impulsive, et cetera, et cetera. Otherwise she wouldn't make the decisions that she makes. So now your plot 
has necessitated character traits for the characters that you've made. And it just happened. Wow, amazing, right? The, the father, he has to be strict. He has to be initially kind of unyielding, but um, he has to have a, a kind of heart underneath it all. He has to hate the human world, et cetera, et cetera. It's just there. It can't be another way because of the plot that you've created, right? The sea witch has to have some kind of grudge against the mermaid's family. Otherwise, why is she involving herself in this? Um, she has to be sneaky. She has to be deceptive, deceptive right? All these things are true. They have to be true in order to make the story that you've made make sense. And if they're not true and you want to have them be another way, then that has to work itself into the story. Same with the setting, right? The, um, you know, the now you've got the mermaid's undersea world, the place where she keeps her human artifacts, the surface as she sees it, the ship, the sea witch's lair, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? All of these places. And again, this plot necessitates certain things about these places. They have to have certain qualities, right? The place where she keeps her human artifacts should be some sort of secluded and secret place. The sea witch's lair is probably not like right in the center of the town, <laughs> the underwater town, right? So again, you, you're giving yourself these gifts of knowing already based on the plot who these people are and who these what these places are. And, you know, I had a question before this about, um, you know, how to deal with characters kind of making bad choices but it just kind of like it seems uh it seems like a plot contrivance like why would they do that wouldn't they just do like a normal thing why have they gotten themselves into this problem it seems like a, a plot hole or like bad sloppy writing and it is sloppy writing if you haven't worked through your whole narrative but now if you've got this kind of young impulsive um headstrong mermaid in this situation then she's going to make a bad decision going to the sea witch for legs because she is headstrong and impulsive and she wants her way and she knows she can't get it from the only other person she can think of who has magic powers the dad so she goes to the sea witch so if you have created the plot and you have honored the plot by giving your characters the character traits that the plot necessitates, then when they make bad decisions, it won't feel like, oh, sort of weird plot contrivance because otherwise the story would just be over. It feels like, yeah, that's what that person would do. That person would do that. It's not what I would do, but the character that you've created would do it because that, that's the character that's in this story. So if you've made the characters make sense within the plot, then the decisions that they make will make sense within the plot as well. And you need to be checking that as you go along. Okay. Um, a couple other questions. Hold on. Okay. Do you decide your point of view as outlining beats before getting to that point? Um, so if, uh, yes, in the sense that if you think that the there's going to be multiple points of view, and I'm going to get to that in a second, but if you think there's going to be multiple points of view, then you want to outline from that perspective. So you, you do want to kind of indicate in the beats who we're with. Like if there's like a man and a woman, right? And it's alternating chapters or something like that. Like you, you need to mark for yourself okay, this is what's happening with the man. And then this is what's happening with the woman. And, you know, I might even color code or something like that because I'm fun like that. But, but yes, um, you know, it, and, and yeah, I mean, any kind of point of view, you've probably decided beforehand. And so the, the, um, the outline is probably from like, what I just showed you is basically from the mermaid's perspective, even if it's not first person narration. And you don't necessarily have to know that it's going to be first person narration, or third person at that point, but you do kind of need to know whose perspective you're writing from so that you can write the outline with those characters beats happening um, where they happen. So you should have that. Um, planned out, but you don't necessarily need to know what kind of narration you're going to use. Um, do you flesh out your beats through research or just imagination, both or neither? Well, it depends on the story that you're telling. You absolutely do need to research things for your novel. And actually, that's another one of the classes that I taught how to do research for your novel. Uh, again, that was a paid class. So if you want um, to look at the recording, you have to um, 
fill out the contact form that's on my website under writing courses and story club live and you send me a message via there and tell me which one you want and then you pay me ten dollars and i send you the recording for that class so if you're wondering about research that's a good one to check out but um the research might help especially if you're telling like uh if your story is a kind of historical um if it's historical fiction or you know it takes place in a real place at a real time and or and it, if it involves characters who are who really lived then you know the narrative of those characters might help or you know certain details about certain places might be interesting to you and you might want to put some of that in there but what we're really talking about now is kind of the 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 skeleton of the the narrative and that is more of a kind of it's like a narrative puzzle that you're figuring out on your own but of course things that you know about the different people and places that you're going to be writing about uh, will help you so i think both is the answer but um i really i really think about the the beats as kind of more of the the emotional propulsion um, in the story rather than the kind of specifics that you might end up adding based on your research. I hope that's helpful. Um, okay, so supposing I wrote 5,000 plus words for a short story that's maybe half done. You have convinced me I should have made an outline, but how should I move forward? Okay, sorry to laugh, that's not funny. Um, I, I'm sorry. Uh, you should stop writing the story and you should write an outline. You should try to write the outline as if you haven't written anything yet, but know basically, you basically know where you're going because you have fleshed it out with 5,000 words. And then once you've done that and you feel good about your outline, you should go back to your 5,000 words, tear it apart, not like rip it up and throw it in the garbage, like rip it up in your Word document and keep the parts that work move them around if you have to and write in additional parts so that it works with your outline. Sorry, that's kind of a horrible answer, but that is part of writing is once you're done. I mean, I like it happens in a in a word processor, but if it was a like a visual thing, I literally like cut things up, I save them in other documents, I write, I get them again, I put them back in. Uh, you know, that's fine. Um but I I would sort of just go do the outline as if you haven't done any writing and then come back to the writing, if that's helpful. Um, okay, uh, I have difficulty making flawed characters, it's so hard. Yes, maybe that's a topic for another time, but but think about the the kinds of people that they would need to be in order to make the decisions they have to make. I mean, people are flawed, everybody's flawed. So characters have to be flawed in order to be realistic. And they also have to be flawed in order to not just like always do exactly the right thing and your story's over in five minutes, right? So we can talk more about that later. Um, do you ever do storyboards with your story beats? Do you ever draw out your story beats in simple drawings? So I don't because I am visually impaired, <laughs> but not, not visually impaired, but I, I cannot draw at all. And I don't think in pictures. I don't even really picture things in my mind, um, which is a problem and I have to go I literally have to go and like Google photographs of stuff so that I can describe things um, in my writing. But if that is useful for you, you absolutely can. If you think in that way, that's completely fine. Okay, a couple more things I wanna say before we go. Um, so we talked a little bit about, um, you know, other kinds of plot structures. And I just wanna say that that's okay, but you wanna be careful if you're deviating from the traditional three act structure, um, you want to be careful to know why you're doing it. Again, you need to know what the rules are in writing before you break them. So why are you breaking them? Um, you know, there should be a reason. So for example, a reason might be um, your main character is a detective and he's figuring out a story along with you and he's starting with one clue that reveals the middle of the story. And then he has to find out more that goes to the beginning and then takes all of that through to the end. That's fine. And that's your reason. Your reason is because this is 
this is how this detective discovers this story and it's a kind of different way of telling a story that's fine but if you're just doing it to, to be fun or gimmicky then stop because nobody likes a gimmick really um you should still use an outline in basically the way that i've described right you want to keep in mind that there are that you want you have large chunks they're probably the same three large chunks that I have described several times now, they might just be out of order. Um, you might also have, like we just said, you might have multiple points of view, um, in which case you might wanna color code them or you might wanna kind of have sort of two outlines, um, one for each character, that's fine. Um, you know, you, you can organize them however you want, but you want the, the big chunks followed by the beats in however, way that you choose to organize this. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about, and then I swear I'm done, um, is how to actually use your outline. Because there's a tendency to write it all down and then be like, oh, I remember it, and then just put it away. And then why did you write that? That was pointless, right? So like I said at the beginning, the outline is a map. Um, and like a map, you're not gonna stare at it all the time. You'll bump into things, right? Um, but you, look at it before you begin your trip and then you might glance at it from time to time as you're going along okay <laughs> there's a metaphor but it's this is what i mean um so at the start of each writing session you want to take a look at your outline where are you right how how you you know maybe you're at the very beginning but you've done some where are you you might even have you know, marked that somehow on your outline so you can easily find where you are. And where are you headed? What is the next beat? Where are you trying to get your characters from and to? Okay. Um, and as you're going along, if you're not sure what's supposed to happen next, check. Go back and check. At the end of each writing session, take a look at it again. Are you on track? Did you get, did you veer off course? Um, that can happen. Um, I always say characters and plots have a way of kind of getting away from us, particularly characters have a way of turning out to be different people than we kind of meant for them to be or thought that they were. Um, and that's a real thing and it really happens. And so if you happen to have veered off course, that's okay. You know, I had a question about how to make sure that the outline is not a straitjacket, right? It doesn't keep you in place. That's fine. If that happens, then you decide if you want to keep going with that. Like if you keep going and then you get to the end of your writing session and you check and you're like, whoops, that's not what I was supposed to be doing. Or like, whoa, this character is doing something completely different. Decide, is that what I want? Do I want this to happen? Or should, should I delete that and go back to where I was in the outline and strike out again? If you decide that you want to keep it, that's completely fine, but stop and go back to the outline. Add that in and make sure that everything that follows still makes sense, because it might not. And if it doesn't, redo your outline so that it continues to be a useful tool instead of something you wrote a long time ago that it's no longer useful. You want it to keep being a tool that you can use, okay? So things happen, it's fine, characters get weird, I get that. Um, but, you know, then decide if you, you know, decide if you're gonna let them do that and then rework your outline or decide if you're going to reel them back in and you want to stick to what you said. Either way is fine, but don't just throw your outline away because that happened. Go back and fix it so that it continues to be a tool that you can use. Um, if you, if what you start with is like, I have a scene in my head, that's fine to write that first. If you have some dialogue in your head, that's fine to write that first. Sometimes you can also add that stuff to your outline, like not a ton of it, because then your outline gets really unwieldy. But like, if you want to remember like, oh, you've got this great line and it happens at this on this beat, you can just kind of type that into your outline so that when you get to that point, you're like, oh yeah, I want the character to say this. Um, you know, or if you've written a whole scene, you can just mark in your outline, you know, whatever the the name of the document is in your documents folder that you called that scene just be like see this document and then you can find that right so it's it's not that like you have to now go exactly through this at each time but you know just you want it to be something that's useful otherwise why did you write it um and it an outline also means that you can write your story out of order if you want to 
because you know that it's going to make sense. So if you had that scene in your mind and you know now you've outlined everything and you know that that scene makes sense in there, it's gonna be part of it. Now you can write it and like, oh, get that off your chest, right? Instead of just like hoping that you'll remember it and save it, mark that you've got it saved. And then when you get there, put it back in. You just have to make sure that things haven't changed in the meantime and that the characters are still acting the way that they would at this point in the story, given what you've now done to that point. But you, you know, you can play around. It's not like, you know, it's, it isn't a straight jacket, it's a tool, okay? Um, and then, you know, the last thing that, um, the last question that I got that I want to address was just about um, sharing your outline with someone for feedback and also how to get up the courage to do that. And I will, so I wanted to say this, um, Sharing your outline with people can be helpful because having another set of eyes helps to iron out those plot holes um, and those character motivations that the outline is there to iron out. But you have to share it with someone that really, really knows plot structure and character, you know, character stuff and plot stuff. Um, so not, unless this is true about this, but like not your wife, not your best friend, unless your wife or best friend is someone who really knows their stuff. Um, and that might help you to feel better about sharing it. Cause you know, your wife is probably the person that you, whose opinion you actually most care about. But in this, in this instance, her opinion is not particularly helpful. Her opinion might be helpful when she reads it. Cause she might, she's a reader and you don't need to know very much about plot structure in order to read a book and know whether you like it. But the outline, you, you kind of do need to know whether it makes sense. So in that case, you want to be sharing it with like a, a, an editor right? or, um, you know, a teacher or a fellow writer or, or something like that. And, and that might be a little easier than people who you really, really care about. If it's not easier, then um, take a deep breath and do it anyway, because we have to do things that scare us. Okay. That is my, that is my talk. Uh, I'm going to check the chat one last time. So put in any last minute questions that you have. Okay. I'm terrible at drawing too. Yes. I, it really is a, um, a disability that I have. Uh, okay. I've long had a concept which I haven't entirely fleshed out. I haven't outlined it as yet. I just don't have a sense of an ending other than wanting to make it end in the sense that it's a series. Um, I mean, an outline, I think an outline would help you with that. Because if you, like, don't think about the ending, take it, take it each beat at a time. Because I kind of think the beats lead to each other. Um, you know, and then, and sort of think about, like, what is the logical conclusion of this, of this story? So start, you know, you've got your idea, it's, it's what if, create a conclude, can create a conflict for it. Um, and then, you know, plan out, just like I've said, like plan out the, the acts and see if going through beat by beat by beat, you, you end up with an ending. Um, try a couple different endings and see what happens. Um, nobody likes a gimmick. Reminded me so much of Andrew Clavin. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, it's like directions printed out from MapQuest. Yeah. It's like that. Exactly. Uh, characters can completely change from who they you originally planned them to be. It's really, really strange, but it's true. They have a way of getting away from us. I cannot explain it, but I know that it happens. Um, okay, so that is that. I hope this was helpful. Um, I I love doing this. I I would love to know also other things that you would like to learn about. Um, I already have in my head how to write flawed characters, so how to how to kind of flesh out your characters and make them seem more real. That's a cool topic that maybe we can get to. Remember that you can hire me to edit your work. You can even hire me to edit your outline. Um, I also offer, um, I, I also have, I also offer um, story development, meaning we can work through the outline. We can make an outline together. Um, so please, you know, in the description of this video are the links to all of those places. So find me on my website contact me. You can just send me a message and say, I'm not sure if I want to hire you, but this is what I'm doing. Would it be good to work together? I, you know, I am currently 
well, it doesn't, this is going to be a recording, but currently it is June 7th, 2023. And I um, am booked through basically the end of June, but I, you know, we could work together over the summer. So I would love it if you reached out to me to let me know what you're working on and how I can help you. Um, I also have a mailing list, which you can join in the link in this the description. And I send out kind of information about what I'm doing. So like, I'm going to send one tomorrow about the interview with my dad and the, um, and this video and the, um, my piece in the American, Spe American Spectator. Um, but also whenever I post a new class, I also send an email. So you should sign up for that if you haven't already. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. There's a link again. That's basically the only social media that I have, but I'm Faith K. Moore at Faith K. Moore on Twitter. And I would love it if you followed me, if you're not already following me. And again, there's a tip jar because it's hard to do this kind of thing, but I love to just do this anyway. But if you, if you enjoyed it and you are financially able, I would gratefully accept a tip. So, um, I see a few other things here, so I will stay on for a minute, but if you want to go, that's fine. Um, do I have an opinion as an editor on using a story grid? Not really. If it helps you again, I am so not visual <laughs> that, um, I I don't work that way, but uh, again, like I'm not the only newsflash. I am not the only editor or writing teacher out there in the world. So yeah, I mean, use what is helpful to you. But I think in general, the beats that I or the the different sort of chunks of of story that I am saying make sense to me. Um, great session. Thank you. I'm glad this helped. Good. I'm glad. Um, how detailed should it be beyond the outline? One sentence. Um, Chekhov's gun is a good rule to keep in mind. Right. So it's like Chekhov's gun is if a gun appears in, I think, what is it? In the first act, it has to be fired by the third act. Um, so you don't want to include extraneous things that you don't follow up on later. And an outline helps you with that. And then everyone is saying thank you. And I, it is my pleasure. So thank you so much for being here. Find me on my website. Find me online. I would love to know what you're working on. And I will be back with more things soon. So stay tuned. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Bye.